Welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where Pastor Jeff Cranston, along with our host, Jen Denton, will discuss biblical theology in an understandable way. You'll discover how to apply biblical truth to your life. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Well, hello again, y'all, and welcome back to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Jen Denton, and along with Pastor Jeff Cranston, we believe what the theologian Dr. R.C. Sproul once said. When a person says, all I need to know is Jesus, doctrine isn't important, we should immediately ask and reply, well, then who is Jesus? And the moment that person begins to answer that question, the person is inescapably involved with doctrine. That's a major got you right there. It is. Yeah. Ha ha. As soon as you talk about <laughs> Jesus, you're involved in talking about some doctrine. For sure. And here at Kitchen Table Theology, we are seeking not only to help you know solid biblical theology, but to know Jesus by it and hold the correct theological truth in your heart, soul, and mind. And on today's podcast, we're back on track with the 33 things that occur instantaneously at the moment of salvation for every believer. Beginning with episode 104, we've discussed and studied a number of those glorious truths. If you missed any, we encourage you to go back and give them a listen. So, Pastor Jeff, what are we looking at today? Or they could look at episode 104. 104. 104. 104. <laughs> I had to clarify it as you much as very, I can. You were very clear. We all know. <laughs> so how, are, how have you been doing? We missed, oh, should say this. We missed a week. In we, our podcast schedule. We did. We apologize to you, our Kitchen Table Theology family. People it, have been sleeping outside in tents. They've yes. been They've been knocking on the windows. Full. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure what anyone. What happened? I know Brother Allen noticed. <laughs> there but we go. But I don't go. know if anybody else noticed. But <laughs> anyhow, we're, we're back. And uh, we're back with the 33 things as, as, as we have been for the last, uh, gosh, I don't know. Ten well, since one hundred four podcast so one hundred four and do the math. Oh, we're on one hundred twenty. It's yeah. been that many. Yeah. Oh, well, we we diverted. We're getting a little near the bit. end yeah. of it because yeah. a lot of the thirty three things we have already covered sure. in previous podcasts. So, sure. So anyway, today, Jim, we're gonna get, we're gonna look at a good one. But okay. they've all, they've all been they've all been great. But we, I think we really appreciate this one, and and we have been. So here it is. We have been instantaneously. At the moment of salvation, delivered from the power of darkness. Mm. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. And that is primarily based on Colossians 1.13. Now, before you read that, mm-hmm. kitchen table theologian, it's always a danger whenever anyone formulates a doctrine based on one verse. Mm-hmm. That's always dangerous. So this delivered from the power of darkness doctrine is not based on just one verse. I want you to know that. But it is primarily based on Colossians 1.13. So how about reading that for us, please? For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom of his dear son. Okay, let me say that again. <laughs> that one pretty quick. Yeah. So let me, like 104, let <laughs> me say that again. <laughs> for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom of his dear son. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Christians in the ancient city of Colossae. That's who he's writing to. And in his prayer, he thanked God the vine. I appreciate you reading that that twice. There's a lot in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. just a lot in that. He thanked God the Father for his work in the lives of the believers in Colossae. And if we go back one verse to verse, you read Colossians 1.13. If we go back to Colossians 1.12, Paul's saying that he's always thanking the Father And the Father has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Mm. So there's the light coming in. And then he says something about the darkness. So he expresses gratitude to the Father for enabling us to partake in the saints' inheritance. And God qualifies us at the cross by means of his mercy and grace. Now, we can't assume or believe that our deeds or our spiritual achievements qualify us for anything in the spiritual realm, except for hell. The mm-hmm. only thing that we qualify for is hell. And as we read those verses, I see Paul definitely making the distinction between darkness and light. And that's kind of a theme that we see a mm-hmm. lot throughout Scripture, darkness and oh, light. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think we get what it means to be children of the light 
Well, because that sounds good. And because we know that Jesus proclaimed that he is the light and in him there is no darkness at all. But how about explaining that a little bit more? What exactly does the kingdom of darkness mean? Well, when when God calls his people into the light, he delivers us. Let's just say us. He delivers us from the power of darkness. So what it means is Christians have been delivered from Satan's domain. Mm-hmm. So the darkness that Paul's referencing is the dominion of Satan. Christians have been delivered from that. And another place where the same phrase for power of darkness is used is in Luke 22:53. So how how about reading that for us and maybe giving us a little bit of a background? Sure. And Jesus is speaking here, and this is the context where he's being arrested in the garden after Judas has given him up, yep. pretty much. The disciples were ready to fight. Mm. We know which one was leading the charge <laughs> yeah. there, I can guess. He had a yeah. ear in his hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of them even exclaiming, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. We brought the swords. We're ready <laughs> to right go. They're right here. Yeah. We have been waiting to can use you them. imagine? No. And Jesus is just standing there. They're and- chomping at the bit. <laughs> You got to love these disciples. And here's what Jesus said as he turned to those arresting him. He said, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day, but this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. Wow. that That's Jesus speaking of the darkness, the spiritual mm-hmm. darkness surrounding his arrest and what we refer to as his passion. He's referring to spiritual darkness authored by Satan. And and God and his people, we have spiritual enemies. I don't think any Christian would fight you about that one. And those enemies have power, and we needed rescuing from that power of darkness. Okay, can we dive a little bit deeper? I'm going to push you just a little bit more. (laughs) Yeah, this is all about you, so yeah. Can, Can you describe how the Bible uses the term darkness? Yeah, let me let me briefly share four ways the word darkness is used in Scripture. First, it's often used in the Scriptures to signify ignorance. Ignorance, and and especially the the ignorance of God and the ignorance of godliness, into which all of us have been born by the transgression of our first parents, Adam and Eve. So this is an absolute, complete ignorance of everything spiritual, everything heavenly, everything divine. And it's I just picture this thick, black, gloomy cloud. It's a dense ignorance which broods over the minds of people so that they cannot see or know or understand or feel anything of the power of God's truth. And you wonder, listening to that then, then how in the world does anybody get saved? Mm. David describes that state really clear or clearly in Psalm 82. He said, but these oppressors know nothing. They are so ignorant. They wander about in darkness. Isn't that interesting, all those Mm. words coming out? While the whole world is shaken to the core, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Mm. So in this sense of darkness, people are by nature, he uses this word, ignorant, Ignorant, (laughs) of the only true God and Jesus whom he sent, and therefore know nothing, really, of eternal life. Okay, There's complete Complete darkness in their minds. Their their minds are are completely clouded to anything of the divine of of God. Okay. Anything else to that darkness? Well, four meanings in Scripture. Here's second one: sin. We probably all knew that one. Mm-hmm. We we know that darkness favors sin. That when the sun goes down and night covers the earth, that's the time where sinners creep around and practice their deeds of wickedness, you know, putting it in the old way. Yeah, and I hear my mom and my grandma in my head, nothing good ever happens after midnight. (laughs) It doesn't. (laughs) Man, I drilled that into my girls. Mama was right. Sin and darkness go hand in hand. Now, there's a third meaning of darkness, and we read in Ephesians of the rulers of the darkness of this world. And the Lord said to those who came to apprehend him, what you read moments ago, this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. So Satan is emphatically the prince of darkness. Mm. First John says God is light. So the enemy of God and man is the ruler of darkness. And, and when cast out of his present usurped dominion, I mean, that's, that's what he did. He usurped the dominion as the prince of the power of the air. He's eventually, he's going to be shut up in the blackness and darkness forever. Hmm. 
All right. Anything else? Yeah. Let's do one more. Darkness is referred to as eternal misery. And Jude, man, what a statement this is. This is in Jude. Jude's the book in the Old Testament. I think there's two of them, Philemon and Jude, Mm. where you can't give chapter and verse. Mm. There's no chapter. There's (laughs) only verses. So Jude refers to, quote, the blackness of darkness forever, end quote, the blackness of darkness forever. So in darkness itself, there is something naturally miserable. If you were walking, let's say you're out in your neighborhood and you're walking across a yard or a field on a dark night. Mm. First of all, dark night seems to be kind of a stupid way to describe a night. It's <laughs> going to be dark. But, you know, Hilton Head Island, which is where we live in that region and close by, I lived on that island for 18 years. There are no street lights, mm-hmm. And so at nighttime, people will often say, man, it's dark over here at night. Yeah. And it, as, as silly as it sounds, mm-hmm. it, it really is because, man, you can't. By you comparison better, to by other comparison, areas. By comparison, you better yeah. know where you're going at night on, on that island. So if, you, if you're walking across a yard or field on a dark night, no stars are twinkling in the sky and Jen loves fairy dust. There's no fairy <laughs> dust sprinkling around reflecting any light. No moon is giving off its friendly light and you, you want to get home, but you stumbled every step you took and you utterly missed your way. You, you just got lost. Were there no other, that, that's a cause for anxiety and fear right mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. Were, were there no other causes of anxiety and fear, such as, let's say it was pouring rain. Or you've been walking for an hour and you're fatigued. Now you're hungry. Now you're thirsty. The very feeling of darkness and being enveloped in that darkness would be sufficient misery in and of itself. I ran across this quote, a great preacher named J.C. Philpot. J.C. had good initials. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like me and Jesus. <laughs> J.C. <laughs> Not to draw a comparison or anything. Absolutely not. Uh, J.C. Philpott was preaching about all of this very thing in Stamford, Connecticut. And here's what he said to his people at his church on May the 2nd, 1851. He said this, To be shut up in the blackness of darkness forever and ever, oh, what heart can conceive or tongue express the weight of that woe? The unfathomable misery of being cast into outer darkness where no beams of mercy and grace ever shine, but the lightning flashes and devouring thunderbolts of God's eternal and unappeasable wrath forever beat upon the sinner's head, to be forever shut out of heaven with all its bliss and crushed into hell with all its horror and all its despair. Language fails to give utterance to so fearful a doom. Now that was That's the power that of was darkness. Said. <laughs> we 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 don't preach that way anymore, and that's the kind of thing you got to read about four times to understand all of it. But boy, what a what a picture of darkness! And when you do read that, when you focus on every little phrase of it, it helps us to realize that the power of darkness really isn't just a term. Yeah, right? it's not a term or just a phrase. Sure. Yeah, and so by that I mean that it has power, and that power can sway the lives of people. There's a, a life and death nature mm-hmm. to that. There seems to be a cause and effect to it, and Satan is its founder and author, and his. His demonic forces spread his darkness into every life they can. Absolutely. So what are some of the effects that we might be able to discern? Well, those are, those are great points. I think you're right. The, um, the power of darkness can be seen in its effects. And for those who have been delivered from the power of darkness, these effects should be less and less evident in their, in their life. Is mm-hmm. that understandable? Mm-hmm. Clear as mud or no? Mm-hmm. So, so, if you are in Satan's dominion pre-Christ, your life is going to be marked by certain activities, attitudes, etc. When you have been delivered from that, those are not all eradicated at the moment of salvation, but you have been delivered from the power of darkness positionally. We talk about this a lot here. Mm-hmm. There's positionally and experientially. Positionally, God looks at you and says you've been delivered from the power of darkness. Experientially, because we're sinful human beings in a sinful world, we've now got to walk out what it means to be free from the power of darkness. So the power of darkness before Jesus lulled us to spiritual sleep. Now we should be awake. Hmm. The power of darkness was very skilled at concealment, all these hidden things in our lives. Now we should live life open. The power of darkness afflicts people. It depresses people. But then after Christ delivers us, we should have God's joy. The power of darkness can fascinate us. Oh, I'm, you know, how many people have gotten in trouble? You say, why did you do that? Well, I was curious. 
Mm. Well, they were curious about the things of the darkness. Now we should be fascinated and curious with the things of God, mm-hmm. right? The power of darkness is a cover for evil. Now we're called to live in the light. So we've entered the kingdom of the Son of God's love when God delivered us from the grip of the darkness. And Paul referred to this work as being imparted. Imparted. That's not a word we hear very often. Mm -mm. It's a a great word. The Bible commentator William Barclay claims that the word we translated imparted, and imparted means it's been it's been given given to us really without our permission. It's just and but not it hasn't been forced on us, but because of the cross in this context It has been imparted, given, implanted in us. So Barclay claims that the word we translated imparted had a very specific meaning in the ancient world. So kitchen table theologian, we're just about to wrap up, but hang in there just a moment more here. This is good. So think of the word imparted, that we've been delivered from the power of darkness and God has imparted the life of Christ in us. And so here's what Barclay says, that when one empire, we're talking ancient world, when one empire overthrew another empire, it was common to transfer the entire populace to the realm of the victor. So let's say the South Carolina and North Carolina had a war. Well, we know we would win. Mm-hmm. The entire populace of North Carolina would be brought into South Carolina, and they would be subject to our government. That's what happened all of the time. Hmm. So Paul asserts that by this, we have gained access into God's kingdom. So the spiritual deal on that is we were in Satan's dominion in the power under the power of darkness. Christ went to the cross. We placed our faith in him. We received salvation. And now we have been transferred, every believer, into the realm of of the victor, and that's the kingdom of God. So everything we have, everything we are now belongs to him. We've been transferred, as it were, from darkness to light. And I think there's an important distinction to make there. You know, when you think about when you have a negative thought, somebody will say, okay, just stop thinking that negative thought. Mm -hmm. But the real moving on, the real healing in that is to replace that negative thought with a positive thought, not just to go neutral. And that he's not leaving us neutral. He's not just taking us out of darkness into, well, I kind of see some light. He's taking it into his glorious light. So it's a complete flip of the script. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like when I've been, you know, when I've learned things about freedom in Christ and so forth. So if you've been believing a lie of the enemy, Mm -hmm. And you're able to recognize that lie or somebody has helped you recognize this is a lie of the enemy. And you recognize it's okay, I don't believe that anymore. But to walk in freedom in Christ, you have to replace the lie with the truth mm-hmm. of God's word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah, it's there. not just turning it off, it's right. adding it's to a, it's, it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's replacing and that's again, that that's impartation and also. I think we should keep in mind that, you know, through Jesus, we're freed from the influence of Satan's darkness, but we may still be tempted by Satan. There Mm -hmm. may still be circumstances that we walk through, but it's important to remember that he doesn't have control over us as Christians any longer. That's right. And we may have to defend ourselves from his attacks. We may have to have our fellow brothers and sisters stand Mm -hmm. in the gap for Mm -hmm. us to do that, but he has no authority over us since he is not our ruler any longer. Jesus is. So since we have been freed from Satan's influence, we are no longer subject to him. Yep. And that, that truth was realized instantaneously for every believer at the moment of salvation, thanks to Jesus, his shed blood, and the cross. Well, that's a great place to stop. And as we wrap up today, we want to say thanks so much again for listening to Kitchen Table Theology. Please take a moment, wherever you're listening from, to rate or review this podcast, maybe on Spotify or iTunes. It really helps new listeners find the show, and we want to spread the Kitchen Table Theology love. <laughs> and don't forget to check out today's episode notes as well. As always, thanks are due to our friends and our family here at Low Country Community Church in Bluffton, South Carolina, for making this podcast possible. Please head over to jeffcranston.com for more information about Dr. Cranston, his books, sermons, leadership notes, and blog posts. And Lord willing, next week, we'll be back with another great episode. So there it is. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Jen Denton and Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, you can check out the show notes at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. 
If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review on iTunes? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's Word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.